I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speakers, and and uh, I think this will be informative. Uh, I think they have a lot to talk about because there's still a lot going on as far as the election is concerned. And uh, so, sit tight. Uh, Dr. Harnish Joan, uh, joined CEO, CEO in January of this year, and he's located in Washington, D.C., where his primary leadership responsibility is planning, implementing and coordinating uh, SHIO's portfolio of federal relations, policy, communication, and advocacy work. He monitors new and potential federal action, including legislation, rules, and other policies that have relevance to higher education, leadership, and activity across the country. Incidentally, Tom worked for a MEC not so long ago. We always enjoy hearing from Tom, who has presented uh, to MEC many times. Please join me in welcoming Tom as he provides us an update on what is next for higher education and the latest on related political dynamic. Tom, floor is yours. Thank you uh, for the warm introduction, and it's great to uh, great to see everyone. Um, uh, wish we obviously wish we could have this in person, but uh, um, you know, uh, events being what they are. Um, I, I'm Tom Harnish. I'm Vice President for Government Relations at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. Uh, we're a national association uh, based in Boulder, Colorado. And now this year, uh, we, have our, we just opened our office in, in Washington, DC. Uh, we're a national association of state higher education chiefs. Um, and uh, it's great to see many of our, our members uh, in, the, uh, in our audience today. So, um, uh, and as, as, uh, as Representative Ballard uh, discussed, I, I used to work at MEC uh, from uh, 2005 to 2007. Uh, my nickname there was the, uh, the Mechanator. So just so you know, uh, you. that was, uh, uh, that was a, a, one of the greatest jobs I've had. And um, it was uh, when I was a graduate student uh, also at the University of uh, Minnesota. So a uh, terrific team uh, both then and now at, at MEC. So um, I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the federal relations. Uh, a lot of activity, obviously, as you're all aware, uh, in, in the federal space uh, lately. And so we can uh, get right into it. And I know uh, that surely there'll be a few questions on, on federal policy today. So I'm just going to... Uh, share my screen. I think everybody can see this. And I just want to bring up the slideshow. Okay. So uh, I'll fo focus mostly on uh, federal higher education policy Oops. Uh, in, in the presentation. Uh, is what First talking about the election uh, that we just had and then uh, transitioning to immediate um, policy issues um, that could happen uh, in the lame duck session of Congress in the next few weeks. I'll talk about um, President-elect Biden's higher education agenda uh, and uh, the 117th Congress and what potentially could come out of, uh, out of the Congress in the next two years related to higher education. And we'll talk, uh, and then we'll have time uh, for your questions. So uh, the pre and post election balance of power uh, coming into the election, uh, Republicans held a, a 53 seat majority uh, in the 53, they had 53 seats uh, in, the, in the Senate. Uh, Democrats had um, 47, that includes two independents. So uh, for Democrats to regain the chamber, uh, they would need a net gain of three seats uh, if, they, if they won the presidential election or four seats uh, if they lost the presidential election. Uh, right now, uh, they have gained a, a, net, a net gain of one seat, um, but there are two seats uh, left uh, remaining uh, for runoffs, both in the state of Georgia. So there is a regular election. Uh, in Georgia, how it works is if you don't get 50%, um, if, if none of the candidates get 50%, you go to a runoff election. Um, so there's both a runoff for the regular uh, six-year term uh, Senate seat, as well as a, a, a two-year Senate seat um, because of a, a special election down there. So uh, Democrats would have to win both of those seats 
uh, in order to regain control of the, of the U.S. Senate. Uh, and as I'll discuss later, that will have implications. Uh, those two elections will have uh, significant implications as far as higher education policy is concerned. Uh, with the House of Representatives, uh, Democrats had a, uh, had a majority coming in uh, to this election. Uh, we had the election. Uh, Democrats will maintain uh, control of the House of Representatives, uh, although um, they will have a much slimmer major a slimmer majority um, coming out of uh, coming out of this election. So continued Democratic control in the House of Representatives, um, but uh, with a, a, a less of a cushion uh, as far as their uh, their majority is concerned. So uh, immediate issues. So I, I kind of put it in, in uh, bold lettering uh, with the relief package uh, to aid, with aid to states and institutions. Um, this is something that uh, SHEO is uh, particularly interested in and the other higher education associations, uh, something that I've been working on um, since about April uh, after they uh, passed the CARES Act in uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, so where we're at with the negotiations right now is um, House Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi has put two iterations of, of their plan forward. Um, their plan is called the HEROES Act. So uh, HEROES Act 1 uh, was in the three trillions and then HEROES Act 2 was around uh, $2.2 trillion of spending. Uh, and she put forth uh, those plans. Uh, the Senate, uh, which uh, controlled by uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, has a more wants a more targeted approach. So they uh, have been pushing a plan for $500 billion. Um, and uh, there are a few sticking points, uh, but certainly aid to state and local governments is, is one of those uh, sticking points right now. Um, but over during the fall, um, Nancy Pelosi, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi held negotiations with the Trump administration and the Secretary Steve Mnuchin. Um, they were Kind of close to a deal that would have been around two trillion dollars, uh, but that view that that deal um, was considered a, a non-starter um, in the GOP-controlled Senate. So um, where we're at right now um, is that Nan over the lame duck session, Nancy Pelosi would now have to negotiate with uh, uh, Senate Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, and um, if, if they cannot reach a deal, uh, then uh, it looks like the the negotiations would continue between. Uh, Pelosi, uh, Mitch McConnell, and the, and the Biden administration in, in 2021. Um, FAFSA, I'll, I'll go next to, I want to go to FAFSA simplification. So we've talked, and I've, I've talked to the MEC audiences for years about uh, the Higher Education Act reauthorization. Uh, that did not happen in 2020. In spring 2020, um, on the Senate Education Committee, uh, the 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 head uh, of the Senate Education Committee, Lamar Alexander, was negotiating with Patty Murray. Uh, it seemed from all accounts that they were getting pretty close to a deal um, on a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, and then the pandemic struck. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, all the attention turned to the, the pandemic, uh, and they did not advance uh, a compromise bill on the uh, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Now that said, a FAFSA simplification was part of that, um, that uh, simplification, or FAFSA simplification was part of that uh, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act and a very popular part, um, something that both parties agreed to. Um, Senator Alexander uh, this fall held some hearings on the FAFSA simplification. Um, as, an, as any of you, you know, with, with students and friends um, or, or family members have uh, dealt with that FAFSA. Um, it's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, so uh, there was, there is interest, uh, and it may happen in the lame duck session, there is interest in potentially um, pulling that out of the Higher Education Act reauthorization uh, and, um, and just doing a standalone bill to simplify the FAFSA form. Um, Senator Alexander, this is something uh, he's been uh, pushing for years. Uh, and this could be um, kind of a, a farewell gift for him uh, as he plans, as he, uh, his term ex expires at the end of the year and he will not be, he did not run for reelection. So something to, to just think about that there could be uh, in the weeks or months ahead, 
uh, a bill to, to simplify the FAFSA form. Uh, there are two uh, matters related to um, uh, the executive branch. Uh, there are uh, diversity training, critical race theory. Um, this uh, were executive orders from the, uh, from the Trump administration. Um, those executive orders will likely be rescinded uh, at the beginning of the, of the Biden administration. Likewise, um, student visas and H-1B visas. So um, there, over the last... Um, few months, there's been a real interest from the Trump administration um, to be a more, a more restrictive approach to visas. Um, with H-1B visas, for instance, um, requiring that the college degree of the H-1B visa applicant um, directly matches that the job that they would take. Um, and for the higher education community, that can be problematic because people come in with a variety of college degrees. Um, for student visas, um, the traditional uh, approach to there is that they would have their visas for the duration of the status of their time as a student. Uh, but what the, the Trump administration has done is taken as uh, provided very um, uh, clear time limits on it. So for a bachelor's degree, for example, it would be four year time limit. As many of us know that uh, many students don't finish their degree in four years. So um, uh, that can uh, prove problematic for some of our, our international students and they would have to reapply for their visas and there would be no guarantee um, that they uh, would get their uh, visa renewed. So um, more restrictive measures uh, over, the last, uh, over the last few months toward uh, uh, immigrate, immigrants, um, uh, students, as well as um, uh, faculty members and, and other people you know, participating in the H-1B visa program. Uh, and then lastly, uh, immediate issue is uh, the budget. So the, the, we are on right now a continuing resolution uh, and that will be expiring on December 11th. Uh, that funds the government. Um, you, traditionally the, the budget um, start, the budget year in, the, in federal, uh, the federal budget starts on October 1, um, but they did not reach an agreement. It's an election year. Um, that's, that's oftentimes quite predictable that they won't reach an agreement. So um, what they did is they just continued the budget out until December 11th. Um, the House has, has passed their uh, form of the budget uh, and the Senate today, um, the GOP controlled Senate put out, their, um, put out their budget blueprint and now it's up to the House and Senate to, to negotiate. Um, and there's real interest in negotiating and getting something done by December 11th um, just passing a regular budget and kind of clearing the decks um, for the new, the new administration. So, um, but that is something again, that has to be, um, the, the House and Senate have, have different budget numbers, of course, as well as, you know, different policy priorities that they're gonna have to negotiate uh, over the next month. So those are immediate issues. Um, and then uh, the outlook on the 117th Congress, um, uh, first, I would say is that um, uh, if the Senate is controlled by the GOP, so the GOP wins um, those two Senate races, uh, I, there is likely to be more gridlock, of course, um, between the Democrats uh, in the House, uh, the GOP controlled Senate and the Biden, um, the Biden administration. Um, areas of potential compromise that I see um, potentially on, on workforce issues. Um, there's real interest in workforce issues. Um, on both sides of the aisle, community colleges, uh, maybe not the approach that the Biden administration uh, wants, but uh, there could be more, uh, more investment in, uh, in community colleges. Um, there's other policy issues. I mentioned FAFSA simplification, um, Pell Grants for incarcerated students. So there is some areas of, uh, of agreement uh, on regulation. So um, this is something that is going to happen on January 20th, literally the day um, the president-elect takes office is that uh, Joe Biden is going to use uh, his regulatory powers um, to uh, rescind several Trump era executive actions. Um, and we've already seen, uh, he's already laid out a few of them, some of which pertain to higher education. So fortifying the DACA program, eliminating the uh, travel ban from some uh, majority Muslim countries. Um, there's one on, on climate change and and there's one more as well. So um, those are just things right off the bat that the, 
um, that the Biden administration plans to do on, on the executive actions. Um, but there's, only, again, as, as you all are aware, there's a limit to how much you can do via executive actions. Um, and um, we'll, we'll probably be testing some of those, the, the, the Biden administration will probably test some of those limits. Um, and one of them, and, and just to give you an example of that, uh, this issue of student loans, so student loan forgiveness, uh, there's going to be a push from the left uh, in 2021 to have um, uh, President Biden uh, forgive some student loans. Now, it's not, it's not clear about well, what parameters that they would have on that, but there's going to be a pressure to do that. Um, up to now, uh, the president, had, President Trump, has, has used his authority to pause uh, student loan payments. So basically saying you don't have to pay uh, on your student loans for right now, no, you know, no interest, no penalties for right now. Uh, that expires uh, on the last day of the year. So um, there'll be pressure in the, in not only to pause student loans in the Biden administration, but also to forgive uh, a portion of the student loans. Of course, the pushback on that is gonna come from Congress saying that this is a matter of power of the purse, uh, that the president doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, and there's also, there will also be concerns about um, when you forgive student loans, the costs associated with doing that. Um, there was some language in the HEROES Act to forgive, I think it was like $10,000 of student loans. Um, as they negotiated, that was kind of one of the first things to go just because it is, um, it is very expensive to, um, to forgive, uh, forgive student loans. So um, those are just some of the issues on the regulatory front. Um, on the political front, uh, control of the Senate uh, Help Committee. I discussed that uh, Senator Alexander uh, would be leaving office uh, at the end of the year. Uh, on the Democrat side, the top Democrat will likely be Patty Murray. Uh, and then uh, on the Republican side, it's looking like uh, it could be Richard Burr. Uh, Richard Burr is a, uh, Senator Burr is a Republican of North Carolina. Uh, he's on the committee right now. He'd be the next in line. Um, but uh, uh, it, it remains unknown. There could be another committee assignment uh, uh, chairmanship that he would be interested in. So, uh, and he will only be in Congress for another two years. So uh, he will be retiring in 2022. So that's some of the, the immediate outlook. I do want to quickly go through, um, uh, these are some of the, uh, again, some of the uh, Trump area executive orders. Uh, I mentioned DACA. Um, the critical race theory diversity order that's likely to go. Um, Section 117 relate, rely, or pertains to um, uh, foreign gifts and the reporting of foreign gifts. That's something that really hasn't been um, uh, uh, enforced uh, in the, for several decades, but the Trump administration was very clear on enforcing that. Title IX is likely to, to go back eventually to the Obama era rules. Gainful employment pertains to um, uh, for the regulation of for-profit colleges. Borrower defense uh, is about um, students who have been ripped off uh, by their colleges. And um, if they can prove that they've been ripped off, um, that the federal government will, um, will forgive their loans. So, and there's also some lawsuits related to affirmative action um, that uh, the new administration will likely uh, rescind. So I do wanna get in, um, spend just a few minutes on the Biden higher education agenda. Um, this agenda uh, is very sweeping. It is uh, very, uh, very ambitious, uh, very costly certainly, um, but uh, this, uh, this agenda would likely require, um, it would require a congressional approval of course, uh, and would likely require a democratic control of, of the Senate. Um, not to say that there aren't issues that they could compromise on, but um, they would likely require um, control, democratic control of the Senate. So um, he has been pushing a debt-free community college. Um, community colleges are a key part of his agenda. His wife, uh, Dr. Jill Biden, works at a community college. Um, so this would basically take community college um, and bring it uh, the price down to, to zero for students. Um, and that would include part-time adult students, dreamer students, uh, and it would, the federal government under this would pay 75% of the cost and states would do the rest. Uh, investing in community colleges. So investing in the capacity of community colleges and community college success. 
Um, so providing grants to community colleges to help them um, with their students, to help uh, retain their students and help those students uh, graduate on time, as well as investing in community college facilities. Uh, workforce training, um, investing $50 billion in workforce training programs, uh, apprenticeships, partnerships with unions. So uh, again, another uh, pillar of the Biden higher ed agenda. Uh, Four-year college affordability, so a tuition-free public colleges. So if you make below 125,000, uh, this would be uh, college, there would be tuition-free public college for you. This is something, uh, and this agenda generally um, is something that was negotiated with uh, progressives uh, and, and the Bernie Sanders, uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign. So um, this is a part of a unified uh, democratic plan on, on higher education, doubling the maximum Pell Grants, uh, extending financial aid to dreamers, restoring Pell for the incarcerated, um, all part of Biden's higher education agenda, uh, creating a Title I program for under-resourced four-year universities, uh, investments in wraparound services, grants to states for accelerating educational attainment, uh, prioritizing work study, cracking down on for-profit uh, predatory colleges. So most of those are in the for-profit college sector. And then we get to student debt repayment. So um, he has a plan to reconfigure how we uh, repay our student debt. Um, if you're making less than 25,000, uh, you would not have any payment or interest. Uh, and then if you're beyond that, you would pay 5%, which is significantly less than you pay right now. Uh, for 20 years, and then everything else would be forgiven. Everybody would be automatically enrolled in income-based repayment, uh, no taxes on debt forgiveness. Uh, he does want to forgive $10,000 of student debt due to the pandemic. Uh, and then if you're in public service, he wants to forgive uh, $10,000 of your debt at a time for up to five years. And then you pay, after those five years, you pay another five years based on income-based repayment, uh, and then your debt is, uh, is forgiven. So that is his approach to student debt repayment. Uh, significant investments in minority serving institutions, MSIs, um, uh, tribal colleges, HBCUs, uh, a core tenant of his uh, approach to higher education. And then uh, permitting bankruptcy for uh, private student loans, protecting the GI Bill, and then um, undocumented international students were not eligible for aid in the CARES Act and he would extend aid to them. So, um, Welcome your thoughts on this agenda. Um, uh, and then if you're interested in, of course, following the blow by blow, my, my, uh, uh, I have a daily email that I put out um, that uh, captures all the latest uh, federal policy and state policy news. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions for Tom? Um, I think we've got a few minutes before um, Barbara introduces Mike. I'll also take questions on the current state of the Green Bay Packers, you know, as a Wisconsin guy, I'm happy to <laughs> happy answer those questions. We're doing well this year. As a Minnesotan, not last week, you didn't do well. Ouch, Cole. <laughs> Go, oh, Lynn. I have relatives in Wisconsin. No. I have to be a little bit cautious. I was going to say, even though the Kansas City Chiefs are really in Missouri, Kansas is excited about them. Well, and I, I really enjoy the fact that the team I follow with all my heart is not in any of our 12 states. Um, the New Orleans Saints. Love them. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, everybody went around the other way, but I'm going to ask a question. All right, you talked about the uh, community college uh, tuition free. Seventy five percent would be picked up by uh, community colleges, twenty five percent of the state, and then the free tuition for uh, colleges. Uh, of those two, which one do you think may stand a possibility of maybe? Uh, getting through Congress. So uh, about the, the first one was the community colleges, the free community colleges. Yes. And the other one was. What the, the tuition free for the four years. For the four years. So I would say that there's a lot, um, a lot greater support for, for there's a lot more support for community colleges uh, just because they're tied 
um, they're viewed as being tied closer, uh, closer to the workforce needs, um, closer to, to, um, to available jobs. So the, there's just an alignment there that people see that people may not necessarily see with the, with the four-year colleges. Okay, um, I, I asked that again, question. Yeah, I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah, but I was asking that because, you know, in Kansas, uh, one of the things we did, especially for the students that aged out if they were um, foster in foster care, if mm -hmm. they aged out, we allowed them to go to our region institutions or our community colleges, uh, and they could only take courses one time. But uh, the majority of them, when we looked at the list, chose to go to community colleges. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking yeah. that parallel with that pretty well. So that would maybe of the two would stand the best opportunity and would, would be cheaper too, instead of totally free. Yeah, and, and some GOP governors uh, have pushed a free community college uh, in Tennessee and, and in other states. Um, some are more limited um, with, you know, only certain programs that are tied to available jobs in the state. But um, there is some precedent for this, at least at the state level. Now. Federal is a different is a different beast, but um, there is some some precedent among the GOP for for free community college. And I see Mr. Pink shaking his head like yes, he agrees that that was there. But I think that's an important issue because a lot of kids financially or families will choose that route in order to be able to get enough that they can get a better job to pay to help themselves. But uh, if I might, Mr. Pink, please. Uh, and I, yes, I, I see that um, uh, as well um, in that, and Tom, it's interesting listening to that uh, from a standpoint of in what we see from the community college perspective to your point um, is uh, the fact that uh, smaller class sizes and uh, some of those uh, issues are some, in many ways, what uh, sometimes causes those students to opt for that community college, first of all, and also the fact that they had made up their mind what they want to do uh, when they grow up, and that that seems to be there as well. Tom, I saw in that in your presentation, you talked about the community college piece, but then you also talked about uh, that second um, possible agenda item on the Biden campaign, uh, the Biden administration, uh, just around workforce development and some of those uh, other uh, avenues to get at getting people to work. And I, I see both of those pieces. Uh, of being, you know, uh, uh, pieces of the work that community colleges, that we have in community colleges do. Uh, but I did, I, I detected that you had two separate buckets there. Is that right? Yeah, there were, I mean, there was investments in, uh, in workforce development. Um, there's also investments in, um, as we talked about the free, uh, the free community college, but there's also investments in the institutions themselves and the capacity of those institutions to serve students. Okay. So um, that's what it was. As, as you're as you're aware, community colleges receive uh, the least per student funding, uh, and it looks like uh, the the administration is is taking interest in trying to trying to shore up some of that support for community colleges. And with that apprenticeship side too, um, vitally important. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I appreciate your your response to those questions. Other questions? Anything else to close, Tom? Uh, I think I think that's about it. But if you have any uh, questions about uh, federal higher education policy, feel free to to shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to to assist. Uh, uh, assist in any way I can. And just again, thank you so much for the the opportunity to to join you all today. It is our pleasure to have you. Thank you so very much. Stay safe. Be well. Thank you.